Previously, we defined what a tensor was by thinking about what happens to a set of components when we move from one set of coordinates to another. And we find that the set of components, T, with P contravariant indices and Q covariant indices. So the total number of components here is N, the dimension of our coordinate system, times P plus Q. Okay, and P plus Q is our rank. So this is N to the rank, okay, our rank R. So we said that this set of components, or this set of functions, n to the power of r functions, were components of a tensor if they transformed between the coordinate systems as shown. So if you have a set of functions that transform like this, then they are components of a tensor. Okay, so in this short video, we'll just have a look at some um, manipulations of tensors. So we've already seen one thing we can do, we can add tensors of the same type. And from now on, we're really gonna just think about the components. So we said that if we have components of a tensor A, maybe it has indices I, J, K, L, M, and they transform according to this, this is L, these are components of a tensor, and we also have components of a tensor of the same type, but it's a different tensor B. Um, but it's the same type, so it's got the same number of indices as A on the top and the bottom. So A and B are both tensors in the sense that their components transform according to this rule. We said that we can add A and B. K, L, M plus B, I, J, K, L, M. And that the result of this is a tensor, which we can call C, of the same type. So we can do something more complicated. If we have a tensor T with rank little t, and a tensor S, with rank little s, then we can form what's called the outer product and this outer product we denote by t cross in a circle s or maybe just t s. And this outer product gives you a tensor that has rank T plus S. Okay. So an example could be if T is a rank 2, 3 tensor, I, J, K, L, M, and S is a rank 1. Um, N, P, Q, R, S, a rank 5 tensor of type 1, 4. Then the outer product of these, T cross S, will have components T, I, J, K, L, M, S, N, P, Q, R, S, and we can call this a different tensor, um, let's call it D, I, J, N, K, L, M, P, Q, R, S. Okay, so the two individual components are kind of grouped together, and you get a rank three, sorry, a type three, um, seven tensor. Okay, I picked an um, overly complicated example. Okay, so that's an outer product. So you can form tensors of different ranks by combining um, tensors of different ranks. And the fact that this thing is a tensor 
is given by the fact that this will transform under the required rule for tensors. Okay, so you can show that this will just satisfy our tensor equation, transformation equation, for a rank 3, 7 tensor. Okay, so let's think about two different tensors, T and S. And T has rank little t, and S has rank little s. Then we saw we could form an outer product. And an example that we considered had t, okay, we'll have a different example, t, p, q, r with s, i, j. So this is a rank 3 tensor with a rank 2 tensor, and the result is something called d, which is a rank 5 tensor, p, i, j, q, r. And the fact that it's a rank 5 tensor means that it transforms according to this. Okay, so we have the D bar equals um, whatever is needed, 3 of these guys and 2 of these guys. So we have 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, uh, D, um, 3, indices, two indices, three indices, two indices. Okay, now we can also consider a different thing. This is the inner product. And if we construct the inner product, it means that we set one covariant and one contravariant index of H of T and S equal. So if we have components T, I, J, K, L, M, and a different tensor S with N, P, Q, then the inner product is formed by setting one contravariant component of, say, T, equal to one covariant component of S. Or you could set a covariant component of T equal to a contravariant component of S. Okay, so let's consider an example, e.g. we set M equal to N. So this gives us a tensor of rank T plus S minus 2 because we have I, J, we have K, L, and now we have the tensor index M, we have S, and we've set M equal to N, so N now becomes M, and we have um, P and Q. So now M appears once on the bottom and once on the top, so this is a repeated index, and we sum over this. So if we set one contravariant component equal to one covariant component, or one covariant component equal to one contravariant component, and sum. This gives a different tensor, let's call it D of rank of type two, one, two, and M now disappears. So we have K, L, P, and Q. So now this is a rank T plus S minus 2. And the minus 2 is because we've lost one index here and one index here. And the fact that this is a tensor just means that, similarly to here, the D transforms to a D bar according to our transformation rule. And in the notes, it goes through an example of how this is shown.
So the inner product, say T, I, J, K, S, K, L equals something, D, I, J, L. So this gives a rank T plus S minus 2 tensor. And related to the inner product, we have something called contraction. And in contraction, if we have a tensor T with some indices, say I, J, K, L, M, if we set one of the contravariant indices equal to one of the covariant indices, so this is contraction, set one contravariant index equal to one covariant index, and sum, then you have a contracted version of your tensor. So, so let's have the tensor T, I, and index J, and now let's set index K equal to J. So we have a J here, an L and an M, and we sum over J now because it's a repeated index, once upstairs, once downstairs. So this, we're saying, is a tensor with one component on top and two on the bottom. And the fact that this is a tensor, again, just means that this transforms to D bar I L M, which equals um, the expression given by our rule. So we've got one D X bar by DX with an I here and an alpha. And we've got two covariant ones, D X by DX bar. And this has an L and we have a DX by DX bar M. And let's have a beta one and a beta two. And this is D uh, alpha beta one beta two. Okay, and we're saying that D, which is this thing, transforms according to our transformation rule into D bar, which can also be written as D bar I L M equals T bar I J J L M. Okay. So contraction is just the operation of setting two of the indices equal to each other and summing. And the result is a tensor. And the fact that it's a tensor can be shown by just checking how it, can, it transforms under the coordinate transformation. OK, so the final thing we need to look at is symmetry. This is reasonably straightforward. If we have a tensor T, and it has indices i and j, then if t j i equals t i j, then we say this is a symmetric tensor in the indices i and j. Okay, and if instead we have t i j equals minus t j i, then this is called skew symmetric, okay, in I and J. And this applies to more general tensors that have more than two indices. So we could have a T I J K L equals T J I K L. And we say that this is symmetric in I and J. Okay, and there's important properties. If our tensor is symmetric or skew symmetric in one coordinate system, then what does that mean for the other coordinate system? Well, it turns out that if it's symmetric in the same type of indices, so both superscripts or both subscripts, then um, if it's symmetric in one system, the same symmetry holds in the other coordinate system. 
So let's think about this a bit more. If we have a t-bar ij, and we know this is equal to um, our transformation from the unbarred via some Jacobian matrix elements. So let's have a dx bar by dx, and we have an i here and an alpha with a t ij. So we're going from the unbarred system to the barred coordinate system. And we need two of these Jacobian matrix elements. Um, let's call it beta. Um, and if it's silly, I call this i and j. Of course, I need to call it alpha and beta. Alpha and beta. So the question is, if in the unbarred coordinate system, t alpha beta equals t beta alpha. So if t is symmetric, or if it's skew symmetric. So if it's symmetric, we have a plus. If it's skew symmetric, then t beta alpha equals minus this. Okay. Then we have, and we just bring these down, dx bar i by d x alpha, dx bar j by dx beta. Okay, and of course, it doesn't matter which order these are. So we can write this as plus or minus and swap the order, dx bar j by dx beta, dx bar i by dx alpha. And we have a t beta alpha. And if you look at this more closely, you'll see that it just defines the tensor t bar uh, j i. Okay, so we find that t bar i j equals plus or minus t j i. So if t in the unbarred system is either symmetric or skew symmetric, then we've shown that if we change coordinates to a new system, then t retains its symmetry properties. It will be symmetric or skew symmetric. And let me stress that this is only true that the symmetry is retained under a coordinate transformation if the symmetry is between the components of the same type. So I think in um, problem sheet one, you'll show that for a tensor that's symmetric in uh, mixed indices. So maybe like, a, let me just write here, a Tij equals T, um, Ji, that this type of thing doesn't hold under a coordinate transformation from the barred or from the unbarred system x1 to xn to the barred system. Okay, so the retaining of the symmetry properties only applies to indices of the same type. Okay, very good. So up to now, it's all been quite abstract. Um, I appreciate that. But if you do the problems on problem set one, you'll become more familiar um, with everything that we've been discussing. And up next, we're going to look at uh, metric tensors, which is assigning a concept of distance in our n-dimensional space. Um, and that's quite relevant to our special relativity and the general relativity. Okay, so there's just a little bit more on the mathematical machinery um, in the tensor algebra, and then we'll completely change tact when we start special relativity. Okay, so keep going. You're doing well.